Hello everybody, this is Kings and Generals channel and today we have a different video for you. Um, today I have my friend Tristan here who wrote the um, Diadoki series and he's in Toronto today and uh, I'm really glad uh, that we can host him. So this format is not something that we are gonna consistently do. This is something a uh, test run, you know, the pilot run. Um, and this is our first time, so don't be too harsh in the comment section. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and we'll try our best. And uh, today we're gonna talk about uh, Wars of Diataki. Uh, thank you, Tristan, um, coming down and, uh, you know, uh, having this uh, podcast with me. Pleasure. Um, I have first question. Uh, we rarely see the generals fight or uh, fight for the control of the empire after the king died. Uh, but this was the case for the Alexander Empire after his death. Um, and, uh, you know, the, it was the bloodbath. Uh, why this happened? Well, it's fascinating. But when it really comes down to is the fact that Alexander dies, and it says he dies very young, and it's the fact that he dies without any clear successor. And it's also the, his empire is very unstable in many ways. Now, Alexander has conquered the Persian Empire and he's marched his armies as far as India. But he's died at the age of 32. He has no clear successor on his death. Roxanne is pregnant, but she's not, uh, they don't know if he's going to be a son or not. And it's, it's, it's just a big part of instability. And so one of the big questions is why he doesn't name an heir before his death. Now, some say Perdiccas, uh, he names as interim regent in some sources, right. but in others there aren't. And even with Perdiccas, he was only meant to be an interim ruler. But the other thing is, is because Alexander has formed this f you know, huge empire, you know, in Asia and Europe. And the generals he has in his command, they all see an opportunity following his death to get their own power, to seize their own power in this post-Alexander world. And so when you can when you combine the relative instability of his empire, the fact that Alexander hasn't been able to cement his rule, his administration, uh, he hasn't had a long-term period to cement that, combined with the characters of the time, each sensing an opportunity uh, to form their own power in the region, then you have this recipe for total war and this Game of Thrones, and you see it throughout history. Yeah. Yep. You know, when you have this this monarch who, as I said, who dies and he leaves an empire which is unstable or it's it's apparently weak, and you see all because of its weakness, you see all these power hungry individuals emerging and taking advantage. It's you know, it's what people have done throughout history. If they see a situation and they see a weakness in the chain of command, they will pounce. Hmm. And uh they will uh, attempt to create their own power and emerge victorious. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, so as I mentioned, it, it was a bloodbath and it, it continued many, mm. many years. Mm. But, the, but the trigger of this, this war was a life triangle between Perdiccas, um, between Cleopatra and the daughter of Antipater, uh, Nicaea. Mm. So um, it is fascinating that all this conflict, all this war was triggered by that event. Yes, but it's very much in, in those times, marriage alliance um, and cementing a marriage, especially in this post-Alexander world, was crucial to legitimacy and authority. And the main reason for this is because of who Cleopatra was. Now, Cleopatra was the sister of Alexander the Great. Right. And she had originally been married to Alexander the Great's uncle, King Alexander I of Melosha. Mm -hmm. who had died in southern Italy fighting a fascinating campaign uh, for the Italian Greeks against the native Italians. But by the time of Alexander's death, Cleopatra is a widow. And, but, and even though she is, I think she's about mid-30s at that time, it's her name. It is the fact that she is a member of the Argeid dynasty, which makes her so attractive to many of these individuals seeking power in this post-Alexander world. So you have Perdiccas, who has the choice between a, a marriage between Antipater, who is one of the most powerful players immediately after Alexander's death, being the regent of Macedonia. And you, he has the choice between an alliance with Antipater, or he has the choice of, an, of a, a marriage with Cleopatra. And in, de in doing so, getting this direct link to Alexander the Great. Now as Perdiccas, as for a man who 
evidently had ambitions to control the whole of Alexander's empire himself, to get this marriage with Cleopatra would have been a gold mine, because they said it would have linked him directly to Alexander the Great, and he could have exploited that mm -hmm. as to show that how he was related and a possible successor. But it is it is fascinating how that, you know, that as you write know, that love triangle, yeah, because as as soon as Perdiccas went back on his word that he would marry uh, Nicaea, the daughter yeah. of Antipater. There was evident worry, worry between Antipater and also for Antipater, it was just a huge uh, blow. But it, it was, um, yeah, it would have been a huge blow to his family's prestige, because in a sense, Perdiccas would have just shunned uh, Nicaea, his family, and it would have been a public thing. Right, and uh, it would have been seen throughout uh, seen throughout the empire as a symbol of weakness. We had so many players in this war. We had Perdiccas, Eumenes, Lysimachus, Cassander. We have Antigonus, his son Demetrius. We have Ptolemy, Seleucus. Um, and Alexander was a great king, great ruler, and a great conqueror. So he was Alexander the Great, right? Mm. Um, so if Alexander had to choose from the Diodic as his successor, so who he would choose? <laughs> This is interesting because you have to look at the context of who, where, who was where, right before Alexander's death. Like who was in the most in general, important. in general, you know, the, who would have been yeah great ruler after him. Who would have been, in my personal opinion, who yes, would have been the greatest ruler? Yeah. Well, that's a very interesting question. You, if you look from it from a variety of different angles, if you look at it from an administrative part of point of view, and who could have like made, who was probably best suited to creating. Uh, an empire which could have stretched the lengths of, of Asia and kept it and maintained it as well as into Europe, then the answer would probably be Seleucus. Okay. Because you see Seleucus in the future, um, much later on in the Wars of the Successors, he manages to create a long-term uh, dynasty uh, in Asia. And for a small time, even in Europe itself. But, and this was partly due to his clever administrative policies. So if you're looking at it, who would have been able to keep the empire united for that amount of time, in a long period of time, then from the evidence we have, it, I would personally say Seleucus is probably one of the most um, plausible candidates. However, there are a couple of others which also spring to mind who could have been very like who? powerful players. Well, one of them would actually be Lysimachus. Lysimachus. Now, I know in the series that we have a... Yeah, he just sits, about, he just sits, sits there doing nothing. Exactly. I just mean, the what watching. the hell is he doing? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, even I'm getting frustrated. I'm the one who... Yeah, like he is just there. But, but he actually had a very, very important role. Mm -hmm. Probably one of the most important in the whole of the wars. Because he created a strong northern frontier mm -hmm. on the Danube River. And he also... Right. Because his job, really, at the start, was he had to cement his rule in Thrace, which was a very um, difficult region to control. Um... And he also had to protect, basically, this new Hellenistic world from the comings of the barbarians from right. the north, such as the Scythians, yes. the Dacians, even the native Thracians. So Lysimachus had to, had to make this strong, secure border in the north. And he does this very, very well. Um, so much so that throughout his lifetime, he creates a really strong kingdom centered um, around his beginnings in how he strengthened Thrace. So Lysimachus shows himself, although our series shows him doing nothing, yeah. he shows himself as a very capable administrator and a very capable empire builder, as it were. So it's very interesting to think, would Lysimachus have been able to continue that, you know, into Asia and stuff like that? But in that sense, I think Lysimachus could have been another of the successors who could have, as you say, been able to rule at least could mm -hmm. have been on the most successful of a very powerful empire how about Perdiccas? because i think he was a little bit unlucky he just lost immediately and that was it and we haven't seen him much mm. um but you know he was the regent for the reason right and he was the you know number one man of alexander for the reason yes you're right you're absolutely right so after the death of hephaestion Perdiccas is um, basically Alexander's second in command. Right. He's even higher than Ptolemy. Yes. Um, and I think a really big problem we have with Perdiccas today is because one of our main surviving sources for the Anabasis and Alexander the Great's journey is written originally, and it's 
in Arian, but originally it is from Ptolemy. Mm-hmm. And it is very plausible to suggest that Ptolemy, um, as we all know, Ptolemy and Perdiccas had a big rivalry in the wars of the successors and how that right. ended in Perdiccas' downfall. Yes. But it's very likely that Ptolemy diminished Perdiccas' role throughout um, his recording of Alexander's uh, conquests. But regardless of this, and regardless of this attempt to tarnish Perdiccas' um, reputation, mm-hmm. he was unique. I mean, let's be honest, he was the only one of the successors to be able to hold Alexander's empire you know, all together right. for two years. He managed it for two years, and he even managed, even though he had subordinate a guy such as Python, who openly, and Meliega, and both of these people openly uh, dissented towards him at uh, certain stages. Python was sent east by Perdiccas to crush uh, revolt of Greek colonists in Bactria, and he does this, but we know from our sources that Python had initially attempted to get the Greeks onto his side, and then to try and launch his own attempt at at uh, throwing, at creating his own empire in the east. So Perdiccas had a lot of opposition from the from the start, mm-hmm. but he still manages to rule Alexander's empire for two, two years. years. And one of the reasons why, and he said he was very, he was very capable and Yes, speak. absolutely. But one of the main reasons he has is because so he has control of Alexander's body. Now, as we mentioned in our yes, in our movement. one of the yeah, prologue. We should put cards somewhere around here. Yeah, here. okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Alexander's body represented authority yes. and legitimacy. And for the two years that, that Perdiccas has control of it, his authority and legitimacy as, as regent is clear for all to see. Mm-hmm. He also yeah. has Alexander the Great's family in his control. Okay. So having those two things gives him fantastic authority to command and to rule as regent. So he definitely had the, he definitely had the tools... But, you know, it's never that straightforward. Yeah, and he, with people such as Ptolemy and Perdiccas' own actions, um, Perdiccas' own actions with Nicaea and Cleopatra, uh, it didn't end that way, unfortunately, for him. It seems to me that Alexander's general turned on each other very, very quickly. Very. Um, why did that happen? Um, did they have any previous tension between them uh, during Alexander's campaign? Well, yes, we... Uh, is one of the sources, and I can't remember exactly, but I think it is. It's between we hear of rivalries in Alexander's army, mm-hmm. and obviously the most famous is you know, um, and dissent with the generals. I mean, obviously one of the most famous is Black Clytus, and obviously his death at the hands of Alexander. But between the generals that survived his campaigns, from well, at least most of them, I think it is between Hephaestion and Craterus that there is a big, big falling out, and Alexander himself has to get involved to calm this feud down. So you, you definitely have these feuds and there's some discontent among some of Alexander's generals. And one of these is a man called Meliega. Now, as you said, you know, almost straight away, you know, this the wars and the fights between these rival generals broke out after Alexander's death. In fact, you could go even it's even further than that. Alexander's body wasn't even cold mm. by the time that they first really started fighting against each other. And this was in Babylon. Uh, where two parties emerged over who was going to rule Alexander the Great's empire following Alexander's death. And on the one hand, you had the the followers um, who supported Perdiccas' claim as regent. And you had people such as Ptolemy, Seleucus, and of course you had Perdiccas uh, and Lysimachus. And they all championed Perdiccas' cause to be the regent at that time. They see it in their best interests. However, there was another um, person who was championing a different a different person, and this man was Meliega. Now, Meliega, we only really cover him very slightly in our documentary, but during the time of Alexander's campaigns, he was a commander of one of the phalanx battalions of Alexander, but he never rose any further. And we don't hear too much about Meliega, apart from one reference where he is basically criticized by Alexander when he when he tries to, he jokes, he goes a bit too far with Alexander about, you know, taking the piss out of him basically mm-hmm. in India and Meliega never rises any further and it's possible as because of that but it is possible that was um, Meliega wasn't well liked among the other generals but this is purely speculation but it just goes to show that almost immediately after Alexander's death you had Meliega who championed one person called King Aridaeus III who was 
well, Philip Aridaeus III, who was Alexander the Great's half-brother. Now, now he was also um, simple-minded. Um, he was ment mentally challenged. We don't exactly know what he had. But Meliega got the foot soldiers on side and he taught them to champion this claimant, well, this person rather than Perdiccas. So almost straight away, and it almost straight away you have this, yeah, the war erupts immediately. And it does seem in some cases a continuation of previous hostilities between generals and Alexander's army beforehand. And from the little descent we know that occurred, it does seem to be an ongoing theme. But it seems with Alexander alive, they were able to, he was able to at least quell that descent um, as they all honored him. And as all the Macedonian soldiery honored Alexander, um, they saw it in their best interest to honor, um, to fall in line. But as soon as Alexander dies, this falls through the window. And as I said, you get all these power-hungry individuals all vying for power in this new post-Alexander world. So yes, we do. We do have, and it does seem to have boiled over immediately after Alexander dies. Okay. Uh, my question, next question is about uh, Eumenes. Yes. Right? So he was, a, um, you know, the he wasn't general. No. And uh, I don't, I don't think he had any military training or thing like that. Um, did he, he did, he did have a little, little in India, but yeah. he, he, he was given a little bit of um, experience as a commander by Alexander the Great, but nowhere near as much as any of the exactly. other big players. Um, yet he was uh, one of the main figures in the beginning yes. of this war, and uh, he won, uh, you know, lots of battles in the beginning. Yes, and uh, you know, the, his uh, people just turned on him, right? Now, just yes. uh, you know, uh, because of the. Uh, lost baggage. The bag, yep, exactly. Right. Um, so, uh, Eumenes seems to me as a person who could rule this empire because he had that political background. He was, he proven himself as a general uh, during uh, Diodoki Wars. So, what if he won Antigonus in the in the Battle of yes. uh, Gabienia? Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's an interesting question about you saying he could have ruled Alexander's empires. Very difficult to say that because. I think Eumenes all the time he and Plutarch makes quite clear in his life that he kind of recognized that although they both shared the Hellenic culture the Macedonians and the Greeks the Macedonian nobility looked down on Eumenes a little bit and mm -hmm. you see it with the silver shields at the end although they're very happy to follow him they see him as one of their own as one of Alexander's favorites right. during when they're serving with him as soon as they hand um, him over to Antigonus, Plutarch says how they derided him, you know, as not a fully fledged Macedonian, as coming from Cardia, not from the region of Macedonia. Right. So it's very unlikely that he would have ever had the legitimacy to rule himself the whole empire. However, Eumenes knew this, and we, as you know, Eumenes was always supporting the Argia dynasty. Um, so at the time when Eumenes launched, you know, his great ex his great uh, fight against Antigonus. You know, it's basically the Greek equivalent of Pompey versus Caesar, yes. but even bigger in scale. Um, but he always, as I said, he always championed himself as the supporter of the argued royal dynasty in Macedonia. And Polyperchon, he, or Polyperchon, um, he, if I have to get it <laughs> correct, uh, <laughs> um, he types in King's General in Asia, which is the most prestigious military position of the time yes um, so he had a lot of power he wouldn't have been ever been if he had won at Gabene um, he would not have I mean he would have been the most powerful man in the empire without doubt however he would never have been emperor in name but you know how many of these you know Roman emperors in the time and many other figures in history you've had one person crowned as king or whatever but the real power is someone else behind and I think Eumenes would have been that person. He would have been, uh, obviously, he would have been the second in command, but he would have been the man who actually held the real power in the empire. For example, he would have been the regent, along with Polyperchon, most likely, of the infant Alexander IV. So he would have wielded, if he had won at Gabeni, it's one of those very fascinating points to consider, because, as I said, Eumenes was really the last big supporter of the Argeid Royal mm -hmm. House, the Argeid dynasty. Yeah, after his death, you know, there's no real uh, support of the Argeid dynasty, a real support. I mean, Polyperchon soon um, goes after his own interests and the death of Olympias, Alexander's father, really nails this in the coffin. Um, 
But it is fascinating to think if yeah, if he had not died, if he had beaten Antigonus, yes, how different the wars of the successors would have shaped. Like, would Alexander the Fourth, would the Argia dynasty under Eumenes's leadership as regent, um, would it have continued? Uh, would Alexander the Fourth, Alexander's son, have actually come to the throne mm-hmm. after a time? Would Eumenes have been able to hold together a lot of the empire? What would he have done next? Would he have gone after Ptolemy in Egypt? Would he have gone after Lysimachus in Thrace? We don't know. So it's a fascinating question to consider how different it would be, especially also when you consider how important a role Antigonus then went on to play. Yeah, yeah. and and successes. and actually my next question is about Antigonus because as a, one of the creators of this um, episode series, yes. Antigonus and uh, um, Demetrius is the uh, main characters yeah. uh, in this war. And uh, that guy is there all the time, 100%, oh, yeah. from, from, from start to end. <laughs> Um, and it seems to me he was a little bit, um, you know, the arrogant. He was, uh, he was a little bit, you know, the uh, people that like the other gen- uh, generals approached him and he just, you know, refused them immediately. Um, he was uh, fighting with Seleucus and then they just uh, fell off immediately. Um, so what happened uh, to Antigonus? Like where he made mistake that he lost everything at the end? It's it's a good question because in many ways, actually, what you were saying, Antigonus was very clever. He is, and he learned very quickly. I think mm-hmm. um, the best instance is after his victory against Eumenes at Cabene. Now, in his ranks, he had a man called Python, who we talked about earlier, and how Python had once served under Perdiccas and then had tried to break away from Perdiccas, had failed, and then Python becomes one of the main players who kills Perdiccas in Egypt. And Antigonus doesn't want to suffer a similar fate, so he has P- uh, Python executed very quickly. But I think Antigonus is a very quick learner, and that's how he gets so far. Um, but he, yes, he, he's not watertight in everything he does. He does make some big mistakes. Yes. And it's an interesting question how Antigonus, in the end, you know, he falls. Yes. But the, but the reason is, is because he made it so clear that he wanted to control the whole of Alexander's empire. He did not want any other successors to remain standing. He makes that clear when, in 302 BC, Cassander, when it looks, Cassander looks like he's being beaten. Uh, He's being pushed out of Greece by Demetrius, and he's suing for peace with Antigonus. He just wants a peace, and, you know, as they have agreed before. And Antigonus says, no, no peace. Yeah, he refuses immediately, yeah. Refuses immediately unless he, he submits to Antigonus completely. Antigonus gets control of Macedonia. Now, this is a big warning bell for the rest of the successors because it shows that Antigonus has no intention of gaining anything except complete control first of Alexander's homeland, and then after that we can presume he would want control of the rest of Alexander's empire. So, because he makes those intentions clear, the rest of the successors, they forget any hostilities they may have had in the past. I mean, for Ptolemy and Seleucus, it was very easy, they were close friends. Ptolemy, Seleucus, Lysimachus, Cassander, they all unite against the big threat that is Antigonus, because as say, Antigonus has made his intentions very clear. So Antigonus, he's, he falls in the end because he's faced with all these enemies from different directions. But even then, the Battle of Ipsus is a very, very close time, close fought thing. I mean, in the end, it is really Seleucus is. Uh, can I say this? Is this going out after uh, Ipsus? Uh, yeah, it's, fantastic. It's, Don't want any spoilers. Probably, yeah, you know. It's probably going to be after. <laughs> good, good. Um, but you know, you, with the Seleucus's elephants, how he stopped Demetrius from coming back, and it seems like Antigonus had played one gamble too many, and it was really in his thirst for complete control of Alexander's empire. And it's a common theme you will see in Hellenistic kingdoms, um, from Perdiccas all the way to people like Pyrrhus and. Philip V of Macedon, Antiochus III, they always want more. They are never satisfied with the empire they have. They always want to get more land and become more powerful. They want to emulate the successes of Alexander the Great. They want to become the next Alexander the Great and even surpass him. Uh, whether he was, whether the Greek king or Macedonian king was the ruler of Bactria in the Far East or Macedonia, they always wanted to get more than they had at, the, at a certain period of time. And this is what Antigonus had, especially at the end of um, nearing the end, nearly at 301 BC, 
Antigonus wants more land. He wants even more. He knows he's old. He's nearly 80 years old at this time, yes. but he still wants more. He wants to make sure his empire is the last one standing and the true heirs to Alexander's empire. So he takes one risk too many because he always wants more. That's the probably the simplest way I can put it. But it was, yeah, his desire to create this really strong dynasty uh, and to always seek more land, which inevitably ended up with him facing too many foes at one time. Yeah, because uh, the in, I think it, 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 it's it's uh, uh, in the second episode um, we see that uh, Lysimachus and Asander help him, but at the end he he refuses their their uh, peace talk immediately, right? Yep. Uh, just you know. Um, my qu- my next question is about um, who do you think is the biggest winner of this? The war? biggest winner. Yes. Well, I think there are a couple because those who do survive the wars of the successors create very strong and stable kingdoms. If from they emerge from the they emerge from the period of crisis, these um, and I think if we're talking about the end of the wars of successors at the Battle of Ipsus, you can really see three main winners. I mean, the first of all is Seleucus, yes, because he forms this formidable empire stretching from Bactria in the east all the way to the borders of Europe, and he then goes on to admi- successfully administrate this empire and create a really strong Seleucid kingdom. Although it does, obviously, it soon falls, but not in the time of Seleucus. Another one you can look at is Ptolemy, because Ptolemy really achieves the goal that most think that he was aiming for from the start. He creates a strong, stable uh, Macedonian dynasty ruling in Egypt, probably one of the most provin- uh, probably one of the most prosperous provinces of the whole of Alexander's mm-hmm. empire, and he has control of Alexander's body. So he creates a really strong dynasty in Egypt, one that lasts for over over 200 more years, 270 or so years. Uh, aside from that, so they are two people who really gain a lot from the wars of success. They create strong, stable kingdoms. And for a time, you also get Lysimachus and Cassander in Europe also having a strong control of their separate regions. Lysimachus, however, it doesn't end well for him after a while, but for the time that he is ruling well, he also creates a very powerful empire. So, following Ipsus, you do get, I would say that there are two winners above all the rest, and that is Seleucus and Ptolemy. But you can't also put aside Cassander or Lysimachus because they have held on to what to their kingdoms. They face the struggles and they've been able to get through them. Obviously, the big loser, you could say, is Demetrius. Yes. Unfortunately for him um, and for all the you know Plutarch dedicates a life for him he is a fascinating individual and obviously the Siege of Rhodes is probably one of his big highlights um, but in the end Ipsus spells like the high tide of his career really he does go on to control Macedonia as I'm sure we'll talk about yeah and uh, he at some point he 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 became a king of uh, Macedonia yes, right? yes. Like, uh, unlike his father yes you know he survived and uh, you know he remained some power yes he did but not for long yeah uh, as we say but but um so I would personally say that there are I don't really want to choose one because a few of them achieved their goals mm-hmm. Ptolemy I think if you had to look at it and if you believe the theory and I'm um, very much in belief of this that Ptolemy from the beginning wants to create his own strong stable empire focused in Egypt is the evident winner because he does that and he does that better than any others and especially mainly because he has Alexander's tomb and he has the city of Alexandria obviously the first city that Alexander founds that we that we think well it's the most important city that Alexander founds and it becomes one of the most important cities of the ancient world so if I had to pick one I would say Ptolemy but you can't put down Seleucus or Lysimachus either, in my opinion. So it's funny how you said that, you know, if Alexander had to um, choose somebody from his generals as his successor, it's going to be Seleucus probably. And we see Seleucus um, as uh, one of the biggest winners of this war. Mm. So um, why Seleucus was... Like, the, do you think that Seleucus was a little bit different than other generals? No, well, 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 the, what I meant in the original question was that Seleucus, if Alexander could have seen, yes. you know, he, he was the, from what he then went on to achieve, he was probably one of the most able candidates that we know, obviously from our history. Yes. Yeah. But 
Sorry, you meant as in... As a, as a general, like, we see him maneuvering really, really cleverly. You know, he was yeah. with uh, Antigonus in the beginning. He defeated the Eumenes, then, you know, he fell off uh, with Antigonus, and they start fighting against each other, although we don't know much details about the Babylonian War, mm. but he defeated. He did. So, and, uh, you know, he's helping uh, Ptolemy. Uh, to me, Seleucus, and uh, at the end, he has the biggest territory uh, yeah. after Ipsus. Um, like, to me, it seems like he, he was really, really clever, and he was very capable general. He was very, in both, um, in both cases. And especially if you look at the tale of Seleucus, like, um, he's, he basically rises from when he's expelled from Babylon by, well, when he leaves Babylon, uh, after Antigonus's return, after defeating Eumenes, there's a famous um, saying told by one of my tutors in Edinburgh University that he he left Babylon, you know, just with his horse and a few followers, and he returns within 20 years, and he's, he has the most powerful empire in Asia, yes. basically. And but it is a fascinating story. You talk about how he was a very good commander, and he served with distinction in the army of Alexander the Great. Um, and then it just keeps on going from there. And it's funny because at the start, at the partition of Babylon where it all begins, he is not made a satrap of any province. Yes. In fact, he remains one of the main commanders in Perdiccas's army, which in itself probably shows how well respected he was as a commander uh, by Perdiccas and by the Macedonians in that time. And it was Seleucus who was one of the leading generals who decides to murder Perdiccas in Egypt. So he was very clever. He knows when the battle is you know, when a side is losing and he knows how to uh, exploit it if you see it that way. Um, but he he just keeps, yeah, he makes many very clever moves. And so one thing that really helps is his friendship with Ptolemy. And so um, after Ptolemy's victory at Gaza, Seleucus returns to Babylon and he has a small army under uh, Ptolemy gives him only a small army. But as you say, if we knew more about the Babylonian War, it was probably one of the most fascinating and remarkable feats of history. Because Seleucus, with a small army, he returns, he retakes Babylon, he defeats Antigonus's army in the east, he then holds out for long enough against Demetrius when he comes, and then he holds out and he's able to defeat Antigonus in a battle. And when you consider where he came from, as I said, just from leaving Babylon with his horse a few years ago, his rise is absolutely incredible. And then that's not even before he goes on to fight a war against the Indian king, the Mauryan king, Chandragupta. Yes. Which is another fascinating war, which unfortunately we don't have much about. <laughs> but as we do with quite a few of these, right. unfortunately. <laughs> but it is more, what I find more fascinating about that is his march back from the east. He gets the envoy from Kassan in about 302 BC, and he's in probably in about eastern Iran at this point. And within a year, or probably less than that, he has made the journey with his army all the way from eastern Iran. He's marched all the way to Western Anatolia in modern day Turkey. Now, if more information on that journey had survived, we would probably consider it one of the most fascinating achievements in antiquity and probably rivaling even, you know, Hannibal, Bar Hannibal Barker's march over the Alps because it was such a formidable feat in such a small amount of time. So Seleucus's rise and how he did it and his cleverness, you know, at times, at times he, um, he sees the best option for himself. He's selfish because he wants to rise as much right. as he can. I said one of the clear examples of that is his murder of Perdiccas because he sees Perdiccas is losing and he sees joining with Ptolemy the best way. But he's a fantastic military general. He's shown at Ipsus in the Babylonian War. And his rise, as I said, he's in his administration as well, creates a strong stable empire. Militarily, he is strong and successful. Um, and diplomatically as well. He knows when and how to strike. So he, he was a fascinating individual who knew a lot of tools of the trade, which he learned from Alexander. Well, he learned at this time, then he built upon during the wars of the successors. So yes, he is uh, one of the most, in my opinion, one of the most fascinating of the successors. I agree, I agree, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think that Seleucus was really, really fascinating figure. Um, I would like to ask about, um, in some, um, you know, maybe not exactly during that time, but we see that if King dies, uh, his wife or, um, you know, the mother is as a, you know, acts as a queen regent. Mm. 
Um, so um, we know that after Alexander's death, Alexander's mother and Alexander's wife, Roxanne, yep. they both were alive. But this war still happened. So I would like you to talk about uh, the, the role of the woman in the Greek society. Well, it's fascinating. It's immediately after Alexander's death, during the wars of the successors, there are a number of women who become very, very powerful. Um, and it is fascinating. We always talk about, you know, these formidable generals who fight each other. But at the same time, you get all these, these women who rise to power, um, mainly if they have a direct link to Alexander the Great. And to the Macedonian soldiery, it didn't really matter as much if they were following a, a woman or a, a man into battle, really. If, if they were related to Alexander the Great, um, we have evidence that they, they would follow and they respected them. And one of the clear cases of this is a woman called Kunane, who was, I, th I think she was the half-sister of Alexander the Great, I'm not completely sure, but she was half Illyrian. And she was all very much this warrior queen. And following the death of Alexander the Great, she believes her daughter, Eurydice, should become the main influence between, uh, she should become the wife of Philip the Third Aridaeus, the simple-minded half-brother of Alexander the Great. And it's a very clever tactical move because in all essence, Eurydice would have much, so much power right. over the simple Philip the Third Aridaeus. So, Kanane leads an army all the way from mainland Europe and gets to the Near East, where she's finally confronted by Perdiccas' brother Alcatas. And Kanane is beaten in the battle, um, but and is and is killed by Alcatas. Um, but it is hugely unpopular with Macedonian soldiery because Kunane was related to Alexander the Great. So it didn't matter if you were a, a man or a woman, if you had, if you were linked to Alexander the Great in any way, the Macedonian soldiery revered them. But the Macedonian soldiery are upset by this because Kunane was related to Alexander the Great. Mm -hmm. So even though she was a woman, because she she was able to get a lot of power because of her relations to Alexander. It all springs back really to who had what relations to Alexander. And, but, after that, the Macedonian soldiery basically forced Perdiccas to uh, relent and to um, name Eurydice, uh, Kanane's daughter, as the wife of Philip III, Aridaeus. So although Kanane was dead, her actual aim of getting her daughter established as the probably one of the most powerful positions in the empire, you know, really controlling Philip Aridaeus, succeeds. Uh, and obviously the other big um, woman we have is Olympias. Mm -hmm. You know, famously, yeah, famously played by Angelina Jolie, uh, half Epirot, and you know, so she was, she was seen by some as half barbarian because the Molossian tribe in Epirus was seen, especially in the preceding fifth uh, century BC, was seen as barbarian, and the stars of the fourth century oh, really? BC. Yes, yeah, Thucydides talks about that in his uh, history, but she also is a very powerful, determined woman. And she leads an army aided by the King of Molossia uh, into Macedonia. And she is brutal on those who are fighting, in her eyes, against the Argued line, which is against her, Eumenes, Polyperkin at the start of the wars. And so much so that when Philip III Aridaeus and Eurydice are both in Macedonia and are captured by Olympias, she has them both killed in really um, a gruesome, gruesome way. Um, Philip III is... Uh, is is killed and then Eurydice is forced to commit suicide in the same room as her dead as her dead husband. So she she was uh, brutal. She was brutal and she was a fascinating woman. How um, how she lived, especially in the wars of Di the Diadochi at the start, the role she plays in Macedonia before Cassandra eventually comes to power and has her and has her killed. But there are a couple of other women um, who play important roles at this time, um, very important roles. There's, but I won't go into all of them in detail at the moment, but it's right. the two most important, two probably the two most fascinating and well-known is obviously Olympias and Kanane, both of whom were related to Alexander the Great and both had that link which they exploited uh, to pursue their own aims. Yes, even the uh, Perdiccas tried to marry uh, on Cle uh, Cleopatra. To, Cleopatra, yeah, yes. Just to, to gain more... Uh, to power. get that link exactly. with Alexander the Great. It was getting that link and cementing further his 
position in Macedonian eyes as the legitimate successor mm-hmm. to Alexander. And we talked Empire. about that. Yes. Right? Um, so uh, our uh, series is almost completed. I think it, it will be completed once when this video or the podcast is going to be live. Mm. Um, so what is after Wars of Diadoche? Well, if we say the Wars of the Diadoche ends in our series at the Battle of Ipsus, it, for then for a period of then there is another a big battle which unfortunately we don't have to know too much about which is the battle of Corypedium and this is fought in 281 BC and it is basically um, it is between Seleucus and Lysimachus mm-hmm. uh, who are two of the big big players after Ipsus um, and the winner of that um, is Seleucus and he goes on to control an empire spanning from Macedonia to Bactria in the east a huge empire um, and the biggest of all his successors managed to manage to make um so Lucas doesn't live very long after that. He is killed by an assassin's blade. Um, the assassin, however, is not a normal assassin in the shadows. He was a he was actually the son of Ptolemy. Um, his name is Ptolemy Corown. I mean the the thunder. The right, thunder right, right, right. I have it here. Yes, in the timeline. Yes, <laughs> and he was just he was Ptolemy the first. Evidently, didn't see him as uh, his own successor. Mm-hmm. So he actually. Um, I wouldn't say discards, but he names his younger son, Ptolemy II, who becomes Ptolemy II of Philadelphus, as his heir. And Caranus is forced to leave, well, he leaves Alexandria out of fear for his own life, and he joins the first the court of Lysimachus, and then joins Seleucus, and then has Seleucus, um, then kills Seleucus, apparently, as he's making his way towards his homeland in Macedonia. You think Seleucus, he had started with Alexander the Great in 334 BC, when he had left Macedonia, he hadn't seen his homeland in over 30, no, in over 50 years. Wow. And he was finally getting to the point where he was marching back to his homeland first ever time as king. And just before he reaches the borders of his homeland, he is killed by Ptolemy Crowns. That's unfortunate. It was, it's, a, it's, a, it is an interesting end to the, the last of the successors. But after that, you have more fights between various... It is the start of the Hellenistic world and the, yeah. the time of warlords, the time of Hellenistic warlords throughout the Greek world, from Bactria all the way to Molossia in Epirus. And it is a time of constant warfare and everyone sharing the same innate belief as the successors had of always wanting more power, making their name through war and battle and victory and trying to become the next Alexander the Great. Very much in that kind of frame of mind. and. Obviously, after that, the next big player you get is probably one my I'm a big fanboy of him, <laughs> and a personal favourite, in my opinion, is that. the name of Pyrrhus. Yes, Pyrrhus, king of Molossia, uh, not of Epirus. He was the leader of an Epirot alliance. That's a big mistake you sometimes get. And Pyrrhus, he has a lot of. He's basically the next, um, the next. What's it called? You know. So you have the first successors. He's like the second successor right. in that kind of thing. Um, he has many relations with many of the original successors. He fights alongside Demetrius at Ipsus. He spends some time as a hostage at the court of Ptolemy I in Egypt. And he also fights a war with Lysimachus. And before that, he has bad relations with Cassander. And obviously, Pyr- Pyrrhus is very well known for his war against Rome, which we will definitely plan to cover. Absolutely, in yes. Stay, stay tuned. We'll have a full <laughs> series on, yes, on you this can count on that. <laughs> um, but he is. He is probably one of the fast, and in my opinion, he's the person who most closely emulated Alexander the Great. And although this probably opinion is might not be shared by many of your viewers, I actually think in many ways, especially if you look at his administration and how he transformed Epirus, he turned Epirus and he basically, in my opinion, he was in many ways greater than Alexander the Great. Interesting. But um, yeah, that could be don't spoil one. too much no, at no, this point no, because I'm we'll, leave it like that. we'll have a full series on, on this guy and I think after the Diodiki Wars um, we will do we'll, we'll have a small pause you know we'll do some Roman uh, Roman stuff and then return to yes. uh, Macedonia and That's Greek uh, yeah Greek world and we the, won't over Greek you yeah. <laughs> um, and continue with this guy thank you very much for joining me today uh, it, it was a pleasure to meet you in person because you, you know uh, in the Kings and Generals channel we work with so many people and uh, you are the first one that we first we met in best, person of yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you very much and thank no Thank you guys for watching this. Um, I uh, just let us know what you think about this format, this video. We are planning to have some podcasts, some uh, some vlogs, you know, things like that. Stay tuned. We have a lot more to to cover. 
So yeah, so this was the King's and Journals channel and we'll catch you on the next one. Bye bye for now. <laughs>